Dr. Sechkin, your name is known for being one of the top endo excision surgeons in the world, but many people don't know how you became that, what your backstory was, why you became so passionate about endometriosis. Can you take me to the Dr. Sechkin who was in medical school and realized that there was something that he needed to explore further about, about endometriosis? You're asking me the toughest question now. So for, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I always believe that the, the, uh, the platform should be visual and platform should be interactive visual like this. So patients can benefit and the public can benefit because um, if we doctors speak, we speak firsthand, we witness this patient's, uh, patient's life and their uh, course uh, in life very closely and we we can really testify for that I, I i i really i get this question all the time i don't know how to answer it correctly i feel like if i speak to my shrink or <laughs> i don't have a shrink yet but even the psychologist it, it says it must have a deeper uh, deep deeper uh, values to why i got into it i i certainly i took the the very less traveled path among many OBGYNs. I mean, if you think of the training of OBGYNs, 90% of the OBGYNs residency program after medical school, it goes into training in obstetrics. Mm -hmm. Very few, not necessarily in advancing gynecology surgery. So, and, and uh, you, know, you know, the endometrial is a gynecological problem, obviously, why I went into endo it must have something to do with my prior medical school exposure in life probably for certain things. But in, in general, I always want to be a doctor aside at times I want to be an architect, but um, <laughs> in, in high school, in middle school, actually, I, that was the first time the heart transplant was performed in South Africa hmm. by Dr. Barnard. I, I know that as a 12 year old kid, I followed that very well. And I made a paper on that by reading newspaper, Newsweek and Time Magazine articles. I made a paper, but it was very fascinating. Medicine is very fascinating. Still, uh, we see today, as you know, we did connecting with uh, patients with science. We did that program this year. I, I emphasize the importance of science for patients because we witnessed firsthand in a matter of eight months, the world was able to develop a vaccine for COVID. Mm -hmm. And we know that that vaccine developed by two immigrants in Germany, which is right now Pfizer vaccine is the most effective one. Mm -hmm. It is the utmost element of a molecule that they were already trying to do for cancer patients, mm -hmm. a vaccine. They immediately shifted to this. And I, I see so much similarity in endometriosis and science and the way we're going right now with stem cell. The same analogy is there. We see that future is with science. So I was a science guy and always, but I, I wasn't the, I like surgery in my program, we like surgery, but most important thing is in my training in early 80s, 1980s, after I finished medical school, the, the biggest diagnosis in women was chlamydia, pelvic infection, gonorrhea and pelvic infection disease, like adhesion. Every woman who had pelvic pain had PID. Wow. And this continued all the way into, into late 1990s for 15 years. PID, well, I... gonorrhea, GC, chlamydia cultures. Everybody, every woman who came to emergency room for pelvic pain were treated with antibiotics by default, whether the cultures are negative or positive. That's then there came the herpes, herpes wave, herpes, chlamydia. Those were the days of PID, sexually transmitted disease. Mm -hmm. These women for almost two decades were treated with this. Misdiagnosis though, Misdiagnosis. Right? And in fact, at that time, laparoscopy was becoming very uh, popular to look inside for again, fertility purposes, but we started seeing something else. And I was, I caught that wave and we, we figured out Later, and I also figured that I was in that group of people, 
they, these people did not have PID, they had endometriosis. So as we biopsy this, there was something else coming out. Mm -hmm. Then we saw, oh, this is the same endometriosis that Dr. Sampson found out 100 years ago. Huh. Okay, but at that 100 years ago, this was defined as a big, you know, when patients have big ovarian cysts, big, uh, you know, deep endo or advanced endo, we call that, we call, oh, it's as bad as cancer. But then when you diagnose this in earlier phases, you saw small uh, seedings in young girls, which they were presumed to have PID. In fact, they didn't, mm -hmm. we, which came back as endometriosis. So in other words, we learned this from patients. Uh, patient taught us because we were wrong. And then we learned that by looking, we were taught it wasn't endo and we learned that. And I think I caught that that uh, that uh, that call from finding and pursuing the the fact and the truth about what was causing the real problem. Um, I have to tell you, I never forget patients that I I have not able to diagnose, and then then I went back and I diagnosed certain things because they per they were. Uh, they, their symptoms persisted mm -hmm. and they got better. And with these, obviously you're encouraged to do, to do more. The problem with, with this situation is because endometriosis is, a, is an extra uterine disease and it seeds on different organs, uh, you have to have a very confident surgical background to deal with this. Otherwise, many gynecologists are not trained Mm -hmm. to, to take endo from other organs. I was lucky to be trained as, uh, as a general surgery resident also in my training background. I did very long years of training. So that gave me a lot of confidence in pelvic surgery. Pelvis was, was an area in body. I was very, 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 very uh, excited and very curious in a, in a sense that it's so complex. Yes. And uh, it wasn't about the cancerous pelvis, but anatomically, there's so many organs, so many nerves. So it's an area where it feeds a new life and it can go nine months and then there's a baby that comes out and where other organs are intimately close to each other, bowel, bladder, mm -hmm. all the nerves, blood vessels, you know? So in that case, pelvis was a very challenging area. So in a way you can say, I follow the call where there was real challenge. I took that very tough road and I, I never looked back. I mean, I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I picked this, this path because I know that I am, uh, I am in this uh, battle with women that I am part of that. If I can help, if I know I'm helping, it's a great, uh, great feeling to, to be able to be part of their healing. And I'm, Helping. Feel I feel I'm part of that healing with yeah. them, whether the, the results are excellent or not excellent. Well, you are part of it. Do you remember your first endo excision surgery, your first patient, what that was like? See, I, I actually, uh, I actually remember my first endo patient was when I was in medical school at uh, around 22, 23 years old. I, I was uh, I was an I was an extern. I mean, in other words, I, I was an intern. I'm sorry. I uh, I do remember we removed an endometrioma. At that time, they removed the ovaries, and the ovary was removed for uh, mm -hmm. ovarian cyst endometrioma. I remember the face, even the face of the patient. Wow, wow. And and now you've come so far, and there's been so much of an awareness because of voices like yours because you created, co-created the Endo Foundation of America. When did you realize, and maybe you knew this the whole time, but when did you realize that people that were born with the uterus, their voices were not being heard, doctors were not, some doctors I should say, were not taking them seriously, that they thought their, their symptoms were IBS or even hysteria, stress-induced, whatever it could have been, but everything but what was really going on with endo. When did you say to yourself, okay, I have to elevate this cause? Well, 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 well two, two, two things. I, I, I knew for sure, coming from a, 
uh, public health conscious background, mm-hmm. early diagnosis and detection is the key for a lot of disease to be to be cured or to to halt its progression. Mm-hmm. All right. So I saw. I don't forget in my practical years as a surgeon, I have seen a, again, you asked me, do I remember this patient particularly is important the way what I did Mm -hmm. for the foundation. I saw so many patients with repetitive surgeries coming for pelvic pain. They look around, they can't find, yet they have endo and you find it and then their life changed. Mm -hmm. This was a Danish diplomat in in New York, which was operated multiple times in, in Europe and after I found something, some endo in her, some area that she finally got symptom free and have babies and stuff. Mm-hmm. So that result encouraged me that that was not be certain things has to be, has to be methodically brought to the public eye and systemically reinforced as far as awareness and, and, uh, and um, study with research. Mm-hmm the testimonials from patients, patients' voice should be brought. So I, I thought uh, the, the woman's voices uh, in her pain was not being brought up. It was 2006, actually. 2006, I, uh, with my 10 patients who are all endo patients or 12 patients, we got together and said, we're getting a foundation going. Mm-hmm. And Padma joined us later. Uh, as you know, it's a mm-hmm. public knowledge. And she, I did encourage, I have to say, I did encourage her. She initially, she wasn't very sure. And then she said, hell with it. You're right. We have to do this. Padma comes from different background. Her mother is a nurse and she's very self-conscious about public health aside from her, what she does as a model and, and a figure said, this is my biological life. It is separate. I can talk about it. And I, I think we always talk about it, but her her coming out, may, I think, made a significant difference. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about it. I mean, immediately there was a Newsweek article, Wall Street Journal article. How could she be talking about this type mm-hmm. of rhetoric was out there? Nobody knew about Endo. It was like Betty Ford coming in late, uh, early 1980s or around that 85 or so. I had breast cancer. Oh, everybody said, what's she talking about? Guess what? Yeah. Now, at that time, nine, you know, five-year survival of breast cancer was not more than 15% or so. Every, every, you know, right now, five-year survival from breast cancer due to early diagnosis, more than 90%. Mm-hmm. More than, almost all of them lives very well. Every early, it's all about early diagnosis. So and we, thought, we thought that, Diane, if we diagnose endometriosis early, if we create awareness endometriosis diagnosis early in, um, you know, 20s, not later than 25, the disease will not jump from one stage to another. Even earlier endometriomas are advanced disease that pops out in younger groups. If it's treated well, those women would not may not end with hysterectomy or multiple surgeries, mm-hmm. or and uh, so forth. So there is a high, uh, high value of diagnosing and detecting the disease. I think that's why our foundation is so, so important uh, that giving that awareness message mm-hmm. throughout the world. After us, so many, so many f- uh, groups have been formed in the, in the, in the internet and in, around the world. Lots of many universities opened their endometriosis divisions, endometriosis clinics. There were none. Yeah. There were none. It all happened last decade after us. Yes. I've been seeing too in the last five years, there's definitely been more prominence. Now, when you say to someone, oh, do you know what endometriosis is? Usually they'll say, oh yeah, yeah. I've heard that where I feel 10 years ago, there was not that same recognition. So there's definitely progress. The work is is being shown because people know what the disease is now. That was something that was not around ten years ago. Um, endometriosis, though, is one of the perplexing illnesses. There's there's not a cure yet. Um, there's limited treatment. What is your frustration as a surgeon with the disease? 
and I'm sure there's multiple, but what is one that just frustrates you? Well, but let me, let me clarify this. I think when we say there's no cure, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's not fair to say there's no cure. I think we should first say the endometrial is highly treatable disease. There's no cure for pelvic pain. There's no cure for unknown reasons for infertility, but I think endometriosis can be removed with good surgery. Removing endometriosis does not, may not treat the real cause of pelvic pain, other things, and disease may come back. But more, I think the cure word is a dangerous word. It is a desperato word. And I think we should have high hopes that disease can be treated. And cure words is a cancer word. In other words, cure rate is five years survival if you're, if you're free from cancer five years, that, mean, that means cure. So uh, I don't like to use the word cure, but I like to use highly treatable disease, but you're right. Endo, endo ends up in some women with multiple surgeries and multiple reasons to have hopeless and negative uh, course in life. You're right. So uh, I repeat that question again. So in terms of, of all of your years and, and your expertise and your success rates yes. where you've had patients who say, my quality of life is vastly improved, but what's a frustration for you as a surgeon with patients? What have you heard that you just say, oh, I wish I could make that better for them, but I, I, I don't know how, or I wish there was more advancement in research. Is there anything for you as a physician that's just frustrating about the disease? I, I, I think, the, 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 the most challenging aspect of endometriosis is giving enough time to create a good base of knowledge and, and trust with the element with the patient. That's, that's it's the veracity, trust and uh, trans, uh, trust, truthfulness, trust and, 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 uh, being clear of your who you are to patient that trust doesn't believe uh, that doesn't uh, develop with one visit mm -hmm. so endo patients should it's not easy to get a patient to surgery very very quickly and that that time should not be rushed yeah. and uh, and and i wish i have more time for that unfortunately many of my patients come to me with multiple having multiple procedures prior and they read about our experience with other patients. I don't have to tell them I'm gonna do it. They already know what yeah. I'm gonna do because my methods are very systematic. I don't change it. I mean, it's, I, I do A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. that doing that gets me better, better result. The idea is when you do surgery, you remove to the point of you don't leave any disease behind. And patient has to know that you, you did that. And you have to give the evidence to patient as video or pictures, pathology reports, every tissue has to be examined under, under microscope. Those type of um, elements in care gives the patient validation, give the confidence and kind, kind of gives them the right to say, I was right to have all that, that problem. Here is the proof. Mm -hmm. The doctor removed it. It's verified the evidence is on the on the pathology report it's verified there then they feel so confident they move on yeah that if you don't develop that the results could be very mixed with endometriosis and the second thing i i really regret well this 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 i try to do in my practice i wish it could be done more this could be brought to a wider practice for everyone the second thing is, is very challenging is the element of uh, the pain element. The pain is, is the single most uh, cardinal component of endometriosis. And unfortunately, if the patients are initially derailed from the course of accurate diagnosis, pushed into the way of GI doctors or, mm -hmm. or gynecologists who don't have the experience on this and uh, go after symptoms without realizing how this could be connected to periods. Uh, the patients get multiple procedures and they lose distrust 
to the system, to any physician. And then because of its pain, they end up with pain specialists. And once what they do, they start with small dose of painkillers. It jumps up to narcotic level. It jumps up to higher doses. And these patients get unfortunately dependent on these medications. It's very, very difficult, even though they have endo, to get, a re to get good result immediately with these patients. So you really have to work on this. I regret this very, very, um, this is the main challenge that I, I, I face right now because it's, it has gotten out of control. Hmm. And patients without any diagnosis, they, they get every sort of um, um, heavy doses of narcotics or, or uh, and I mean, if these come in, in suppositories, it goes to rectally or hmm. vaginally to Valiums and you name it, you know, from vaginal, but, you know, Botoxes, it doesn't really stop. So, and without any diagnosis, IBS is, is the biggest I say IBS is BS if it's endometriosis. Yeah. If you say IBS, yes, treat it, manage it. But if it doesn't work, work. And the symptoms are coinciding with periods. If you have IBS and killer, killer cramps, mm -hmm. if you have IBS of, or painful intercourse, hey, wake up. Right. It's, it's not IBS. IBS is a, is, is a syndrome. That means that we, you, are, you have bowel problems, but we don't know what. That's what yeah. IBS is. So it is endo, consider endo. If it's, you have other symptoms with, if your IBS flares up with periods, consider endo. Mm -hmm. So these, if I had the, uh, if I had the opportunity, this, this issues of frustrations are, are basically patients coming late with multiple procedures, uh, with, uh, uh, with burning, with ablation or, you know, sexy procedure with robot, you do this, I advance this, advance that. Patients don't understand the bottom line, the disease has to be widely rejected, excised, deeply removed. So fresh tissue can repair itself without endo. If you leave endo, that tissue stays as inflammatory tissue. So um, among many things, many things, these are maybe technical, but in general, I wish the, the uh, fertility word respects endo as much as we care the patient about their pain issues. Fertility world for them, endo is only when they see on sonogram. Yeah. The, the endometrioma, because they have to suck an egg there and mm -hmm. endometrioma stays on their way. So that's the only endo they know. They don't really diagnose any deep endo with bowels or no. peritoneal endo where patients suffer so much yeah. because it's not, it's not about getting pregnant business. Also, obviously there's also silent endo. In other words, they may be even symptomatic, but they, they have normalized their, their pain mm -hmm. culturally or for whatever the reason or Whatever work they do, they bite the, they, uh, their tongues and, and move, move along. And society has not come up with issues that, that women should not really have pain uh, with their periods, really should not as much. One day maybe. Anything be, be, beyond that is not normal. But society historically, to the roots of our biblical origins, women are supposed to have pain and they're punished with it and it is good that's the way god created it so the say the same thing goes on right now i mean uh, yeah. we, we can go not. deep on that i mean we're living in a world still we have in certain parts of the world there are menstrual huts i mean if if you are you're having period you got to go to that hut and some women and be there until your period is over and and every year we hear somewhere from india or nepal one young girl get, gets burned there due to it's very cold, try to set up a fire and, and unfortunately could not get out and that becomes a TV news. Every, it yeah. happens every December, you hear it. And then here we are in 2021 in the United States where women are, you know, anyone born with a, a uterus, they are told that they have all the same rights. But when it comes to diseases like endometriosis, we're still not getting the money as, as easily as other things. Um, there's still a stigma about talking about your period. These things are getting broken down because of work that you are doing, 
work that the foundation is doing, work that we're trying to do here at Endo TV to normalize a conversation that a woman's menstrual cycle is not something that we cannot discuss. It should not be stigmatized, that it is a natural course of life. And if something isn't right, it's okay to express that and get help from the right physicians, from the right experts. Like you said, early intervention. I look back, I got my period when I was 11 years old. I had terrible periods. I had ovarian cysts that kept bursting and I was in terrible pain, vomiting. And no one mentioned endo to me. Years later, I'm 33, turning 33, and that in the hospital, no one's telling me what's wrong. Um, no one mentioned endo. It took me forever to get the diagnosis. And I had more advanced disease because from 11 to 33 is a very long time. So I'm hopeful for the future generation of, of women, girls, individuals born with the uterus that they won't have to wait so long so that as you said, Dr. Sechkin, they can get that early diagnosis and the proper early intervention so that they don't become advanced and they can like you said, get, get it highly, it's highly treatable at that point. Well, this is, this is the, I mean, I, I like to give a quote uh, about, I mean, as a man, I, I get goosebumps when I say this because um, it's a very important aspect of voicing. No one understands except those of us who have the disease. This is this is uh, this is this is the words of a Canadian sociologist, which uh, she's she apparently she, I don't know her personally, but I read her articles. It's a great way of saying only women can understand endometriosis, number mm -hmm. one. But that shouldn't give the right not to unite. In other words, yeah. uh, as a man, I, I feel like. Yes, I don't have period, but in, on, the other hand, on the other hand, I, I have spoken thousands of women with this disease. I've seen their insights. So what can unite is the science. I think I regret endo community is divided. Same. And like you being say, you're talking about, if I say, for example, endometriosis associated with menstruation or retrograde ble uh, bleeding or something like that, they would pick this and try to put me down because I said that word, mm -hmm. it is what kind of doctor is this, that kind of stuff. Just the opposite, I see it because you, you cannot be flat earther. There is science behind it. The science is endo is associated with, with menstruation. Does menstruation cause endo? We don't know that. However, it triggers it. It has the material, genetic material like seeds. It provokes the disease that is in the, in the genetics of the woman that is able to develop it, whether, whatever the root. So I personally think science should be the key to unite us. We have to have be one voice and I'm sure that's gonna happen. And the only way to do is public health, seeing this as a public health issue. Yes. It's a public health issue, but it involves women because it involves women's reproductive rights it involves women's productivity as a mother as a single woman as a as a career woman as a scientist as a journalist as a professional as as a partner mm -hmm. it's it's they deserve to be on equal grounds in today's modern world where men are not soldiers anymore <laughs> we are all we all work for for the good of the public and I think for public health, this is an important issue vertically, not one layer. It's not a pandemic. It involves 30 years of reproductive life, mm -hmm. every element of it, and everybody is involved with it. Unfortunately, in public health, these are not easily recognizable unless monetary losses are brought to table. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are monetary losses. With today's mathematics, we can really, these things will be, I'm sure will be written. That's mm -hmm. why research is important. In, in, in our foundation, we stress the value of research. I hope we could give some money to these issues by, yeah. by uh, economists, by, um, by sociologists who can really write these, bring it to the attention of public health uh, scholars so that we produce government can spend time, spend more money on research, 
dealing with this, bringing these issues up. So it be becomes important. I, I really think there's more to be done. We're really co coming to an age that we will get down to the business of endo being not only surgery, but other ways, the mm -hmm. non-surgically, this the disease will be treated also not by uh, pharmaceutical uh, expensive drugs that basically numbs the whole uh, femininity of being a woman. I mean, basically shutting off your hormones completely and turning you into a, a hormonal creature is not the way to treat endo. Right. I mean, that's, that's really, should, is not that, that what Lupron does, that Orelisa does. Mm -hmm. uh, at least birth control pills are more benign. You know, it's, it, it does give an excellent result in many times. Well, thank you, Dr. Seshkin, for joining us today. This is the beginning of many episodes that we're going to have you on to discuss a variety of topics regarding endometriosis. And I just want to say personally, thank you for what you've done to pioneer this field, to help so many who are suffering. Uh, it's because of the Endo Foundation and your name that I was able to even know about endometriosis when I was at a loss. So, um, it's personal. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Sachkin. It's a pleasure.